Hello everyone, I'm Gab Notley. Thank you for joining us today. A few weeks back we asked shareholders if there was anything they would like more information on about BHP's strategy, how the board is thinking about the world and BHP's prospects. And our chairman, Ken McKenzie, is here with me today to answer those questions. They actually cover a wide range of topics from growth, markets, shareholder returns, as well as some of the big issues, including decarbonisation. Thanks for joining us today, Ken. Oh, it's great to be here, Gab. Thanks. Perhaps before we take questions, maybe it would be good for you to give us an overview of how the board is thinking about BHP and its opportunities. Sure. Well, look, as always, I'd like to start with safety. And um, 23 was a, was a difficult year from a safety perspective for the company. We had two tragic fatalities, one in our Western Australian iron ore operation and another one in our Olympic Dam operation. And the organization has taken uh, those incidents very hard. Um, I think shareholders would be aware that it's been four years since we've had a fatality at BHP. And in the case of uh, Western Australian iron ore and Olympic Dam, it's been over a decade since there's been a fatality in those operations. Um, so obviously our sympathy goes out to uh, you know, the families and, and, and the co-workers who would have been impacted by these incidents. Um, and look, we can't bring the co-workers back, but what we can do is work very hard to ensure that these types of incidents don't happen again at BHP. And so we are doing thorough investigations around them. Uh, you know, getting the learnings from those, sharing them widely internally, but we're also sharing them externally with our uh, resource sector uh, peers as well. And we need to double down on the execution of, of safety processes in the field, and we'll continue to drive the safety culture needed to eliminate these sorts of uh, uh, incidents from occurring again within the, within the company. So safety is our number one priority. Um, but the company is also working hard on uh, strategic positioning of the portfolio. Uh, you know, shareholders will be aware it's been a busy couple of years at BHP. We've had the unification of our dual listed structure where we uh, unwound uh, the dual listing and consolidated here on the ASX. Uh, there was the exit from our petroleum uh, business, which was an innovative transaction where we sold our petroleum business to Woodside in exchange for shares and then, and then demerged those shares uh, out to shareholders, which was quite an accretive transaction. Um, there's been the ongoing consolidation of our, of our coal portfolio as we exit uh, energy coal progressively and focus on the higher quality, higher value add metallurgical coal uh, within our portfolio. And um, shareholders would be aware we've just entered into agreement to divest the Donia and the Blackwater Mines in Queensland, and that's obviously a further refinement of that uh, metallurgical coal portfolio. And we're very much focused on what we call future-facing commodities. So that's copper, that's nickel, and that's potash. And in the case of potash, we've got that exciting uh, greenfield project in Canada, over $5 billion US dollar investment, uh, should be coming on stream in, uh, in 2026. Um, and in the case of uh, you know, nickel and copper, there was the acquisition of Oz Minerals, another exciting project. Uh, both uh, uh, nickel assets in, in Western Australia and copper assets in, in, in South Australia. In terms of operational performance, you know, our focus has been on safety, reliability, productivity. Uh, and we've generated strong margins in cash flows uh, last year. We had a, a dividend of, uh, of $1.70 US per share, which was a 64% uh, payout ratio. And that was the third largest ordinary dividend in BHP's history. And if you look over the last three years, it's been 40 billion US dollars in cash dividends, fully franked um, for shareholders. Um, and we have been the largest, this is an interesting fact actually, we have been the largest dividend payer globally over the past two years. So, so very strong cash generation. And I think if you look at the company's economic contribution, it's been 54.2 billion US dollars last year. And that's, that's defined as you know, payments to suppliers, payments to employees, uh, community contributions, and, and also taxes and, uh, and royalties to government. And we paid 8% of all Australian company tax last year. 
Um, and this economic contribution is part of our broader, our broader social value agenda. On the social evalu value agenda, the board talked about a framework for that. Where, how has that progressed in the, in the past year? Yeah, so that, that framework was launched last year. There's, there's six pillars in that social value framework. Decarbonization, the environment, indigenous partnerships, workforce, communities, and supply chains. And for each one of those pillars, we've got systems and processes and, and targets for each of them. So it's a, it's a really well-defined framework. And I, I would encourage shareholders who, if, they don't, if they're not familiar with it, to go to the website. It's there and, and to have a look. And, and I think there were three, to your question, there were three highlights in my view. Uh, last year, the, you know, the first is in the decarbonization pillar. Um, we were able to reduce our scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions by 11% year on year. And that brings our reduction overall in scope one and two since our baseline year of 2020 to 32%. So I think we're making good progress there. Indigenous partnerships, um, and, and, and really that's, we're focused around procurement with indigenous businesses. Um, and that's increased to over 330 million US dollars and around 220 suppliers, so effectively doubling um, that quantum year on year. So again, good, good progress. And then, and then finally, uh, in our workforce, um, I think everyone's aware we've got a, a, a very ambitious um, uh, gender balance target for 2025 that we launched back in 2016 and we made further progress last year. Female participation uh, in the company is over 35% now, which is a doubling of uh, female participation since, since when we launched the target in, in 2016. So again, another highlight for, for last year in my view. Really interesting summary and, and obviously a lot of big numbers. I actually want to um, go to a couple of questions that have come in around um, shareholder returns and dividends, Ken. The first is from KT who asks, is BHP share price undervalued? Why has the share price not steadily increased with BHP's impressive performance that, um, that you've actually spoken to? And then maybe at the same time, um, a question on the dividend from Raymond. He says, when the fertiliser business starts producing in 2026, can you see an increase in the dividend? Right. So look, great questions. The, you know, the market determines the share price, and I'm not going to try and second guess uh, the market, but I will make a couple of comments. Uh, last financial year, lower global commodity prices were the main reason for our drop, for our drop in earnings, and, and that's outside of our control. But in terms of things that we can control, our operational performance and managing costs, we did very well. And we continue to be the lowest cost iron ore producer in the world, and as a matter of fact, the gap between us and number two widened again last year. So we're, we're continuing to make progress there. Again, last year our total shareholder return was, was 20%, so that's the combination of both share price accretion and, and, and dividend yield. And over the past five years, our, our average annual return has been around 15%, and that's well above the ASX uh, 200. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, dividends, uh, 40 billion US dollars over the last three years. And I think that that's, um, you know, we want to continue to, to, to generate that cash that allows us to continue to pay strong dividends going forward. And we've got a payout ratio of 50% of, of profit after tax as a dividend, as a dividend policy. Um, which leads to the question from, from Raymond around potash. And um, yes, expected production for Janssen, which is our, 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 our potash asset, is, is for late 2026. It's an exciting new commodity for BHP. It's another growth front um, for BHP. We're developing one of the largest and lowest cost potash mines in the world. And, and I think importantly, it's gonna have lower operational greenhouse gas emissions uh, within its footprint, and the water uh, use intensity uh, will be lower relative to, to other mines uh, in, in the potash segment. So I think both of those greenhouse gas emissions and, and lower water use intensity are, are important for um, you know, our social value uh, agenda as well. And we're going to have options uh, to grow the business for decades um, and decades. Uh, and you know, there's 100 
years plus of, of ore in the ground. Um, and so this is going to be an opportunity to deliver long-term value for shareholders. Thank you. And maybe um, I could uh, put another question to you from Arthur, who is asking about other metals and, and BHP's interest. He says, I really like that BHP is starting to position itself towards copper production, but aren't you considering greater diversification in this sector? Aluminium appeared on the market. When aluminium first appeared on the market, it cost more than gold, and now it's one of the most popular industrial raw materials and very cheap at that. Most, over 80% of aluminium, he says, comes from recycling, which makes this metal cheap. Isn't BHP considering takeovers of companies purchasing non-ferrous metals to recover raw materials? Right. There's a bit in that question, <laughs> isn't there? So uh, let's sort of un unpack it. Look, copper is one of our future-facing commodities, and, and people may not realize that BHP has the largest resource base of copper of any company globally. So, so we're already well positioned, and our outlook is that copper will go from, from strength to strength in, in coming decades because more copper is needed to supply global demand that's going to be driven by decarbonization and support for an increasing uh, urbanized population. Yeah, and so on the case of decarbonization, for an example, you know, I drive an electric vehicle. There is four times the copper in an electric vehicle than there is in a standard uh, combustion engine vehicle. So that's where the demand for this copper is going to come from as we decarbonize and we electrify, the demand for copper is going to increase. And towards the end of this de decade, we anticipate the global uh, deficits in copper, uh, that's the difference between global demand and, and what is produced, will start to grow. Um, we're always looking at how we can grow further value from our existing uh, copper assets, which are in Chile and, and, and in Australia. But copper is also uh, a major focus of our exploration activities uh, globally. And so Oz Minerals, which I, which I talked about in, you know, in the opening comments, will create a new copper province opportunity in South Australia by combining our existing Olympic Dam operation um, and the potential Oak Dam uh, discovery. So we've, we've got a, an exploration uh, project ongoing in, uh, called Oak Dam, which is south of Olympic Dam and combining Olympic Dam, potentially Oak Dam, with the two assets that we've acquired, Carapatina and Prominent Hill Mines, which came from Oz Minerals. There's a, there's a great opportunity to put all of those assets together into a copper province and to extract further synergies uh, from that. So it's, it's an opportunity um, that is contingent on us continuing to have the right policy settings to enable the investment, but it's an exciting copper growth opportunity here in Australia. Um, the second part of that question, I think, was about moving into metals recycling. Um, I think that's you know, a bit of a different um, proposition for, for BHP. I think we always have to think about, you know, is this an attractive business for BHP to be in? Do we have the capabilities? You know, what's the risk profile of this business? And fundamentally, is this the best place for us to invest our shareholders' dollars? And I think in the case of metals recycling, it's, it's not naturally aligned with, with the BHP uh, capability set. Thanks, Ken. Um, maybe, and maybe you've answered it, but uh, Lauren has asked a general question about growth. Um, she says, where is BHP's growth going to come from and do you have priorities for the growth? Right. Well, it's a great question, Lauren, and I think copper we've touched on. Um, so our resource base continues to provide organic development opportunities in our world-class assets, both you know, in Australia um, and in Chile for our copper assets. Um, but it also includes our investment in potash in Canada, and I've talked about that as well. Uh, again, it's coming on um, stream into production in, in late uh, calendar year 2026, and this provides you know, horizons of growth opportunity for, for BHP. But beyond those opportunities, um, which is growth from our existing assets, we also have and, and are looking at four further levers for growth. Technology and innovation, early stage entry, exploration, and of course, you know, there's the potential for, for further M&A. Ken, maybe um, this is uh, somewhat related and probably you're thinking about this as well. One of our shareholders has asked about debt 
and capital expenditure. Right. It's from Angela um, and she says, I was looking through the annual report and saw that debt has increased substantially and I also saw that you are looking to increase capital expenditure going forward as well. Should I as a shareholder be starting to get worried? Right. Look. Great question, Angela, and this, is, this allows me to talk about one of my favorite topics, as you know, which is our, our famous capital allocation framework, which guides all of our decision making around capital allocation and, and how we use the cash flows of the company. So, so how does it work? Um, you know, the, the good news is, um, you know, in BHP, because of the strong, uh, you know, positions that we have, you know, the business generates cash through the cycle. Um, and how we allocate that cash is a key determinant of how much value we create for shareholders. And the way it works is with the cash coming in, we have three what I call first calls on cash. So three first priorities for the cash that the operations generate. And the first is a minimum payout ratio for the dividend of 50% of, of profit. So I think that answers Angela's question around, around the stability of the dividend. There is, a, there is a policy around a minimum payout ratio of 50% of profit. Second call on cash is we look at maintenance capital. And maintenance capital is what we need to keep our operations reliable and safe and, and also to continue to decarb decarbonize them. And that's the second call on, on cash. And the third, uh, coming to, to the question around the debt, is the balance sheet. And we have a net debt target of between five and 15 billion US dollars. Now, how did we come to that, to that target? Well, what we've the balance sheet is designed um, so that if we were to go through a down cycle of let's say three years, and so we we programmed you know the prices of a down cycle into you know our business model over three years, and let's say we still wanted to continue to spend the ten billion dollars or so of capex per year over that period of time, and we plug that into the model as well, and then above and beyond that, because we think value is created at the bottom of the cycle, we want to have flexibility in the balance sheet to do things. You know, it could be buyback shares or it could be to make an acquisition. And we factored that into the model. And, and so if we look at that modeling, you know, five to $15 billion of debt is around the right number to be ready to, for the bottom of the cycle to continue to invest in the business and to have some flexibility to look at opportunities if it were to arise. Now, again, um, Angela's right in that, you know, we had virtually no debt and now we've got about 11 billion US dollars of debt. And that's about in the middle of that five to $15 billion range. So, you know, comfortable, but that, that um, increase in debt has, has come from the acquisition of Oz Minerals, which was about 7 billion US dollars. And so that's largely where it's, where it's come from. We still have a very strong balance sheet. And I think it's important that we're not pursuing growth for growth's sake, but we're, we're pursuing growth for value creation for shareholders. And we're always thinking through the lens of how is this going to create value for shareholders. Thank you, Ken. That's um, great. I'm actually going to go um, a little bit into the business now back again. Um, it's a question from Sonia and she um, asks about West Australian iron ore. She says, what is the outlook for West Australian iron ore? if um, China and Taiwan tensions escalate to conflict, given embargoes would be implemented preventing export to China of iron ore. Right. So look, we have excellent Western Australian iron ore operations, you know, lowest cost producer in the world. China is our biggest iron ore customer. As a matter of fact, it's the biggest iron ore customer in the world. You know, China produces around a billion tons of steel every year. So it's by far and away the biggest customer. Um, we've developed and we, and we continue to have long standing, stable and mutually beneficial relationships with our Chinese customers. But I think the question is in terms of geopolitical issues, um, you know, the reality is they're outside of our control, but, but it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about. If you think about the last 30 or 40 years, we saw global economies and supply chains coming together in a period of, of very strong economic cooperation. And now we see the world becoming a bit more polarized between, between East and West. And so, you know, our job is to look at a full range of scenarios to try to understand the impact to our business and develop contingency plans and to prepare for scenarios that could occur. And so we are ready for that. But that said, I have to say I'm 
very optimistic. We, as I said, we've got very strong relationships with our, with our customers in China, but fundamentally there's a mutual dependency here. You know, China's the biggest uh, customer for iron ore, and so we need them. Um, but they don't have iron ore. And you know, uh, Australia Inc., if you like, all of the suppliers here in Australia, we're the largest supplier of iron ore. And there's really only, it's a global duopoly, there's really only one other source of supply, and that's Brazil. And so there's this mutual dependency between uh, you know, our, uh, China and Australia around, around steel production. And so um, that's what drives my optimism, that we'll continue to be pragmatic around that. Now, looking forward, about 70% of the world's seaborne iron ore goes into China. But it's about 50% for copper, and it's about 25% potash. So if you think about our growth commodities going forward, they're less dependent on, on China. So over the longer term, you're going to see some customer diversification. Thanks, Ken. Um, switching it back into Australia, um, Ken, we've had a, a quite a few questions on BHP support for the Yes campaign as part of the recent uh, Indigenous Voice to Parliament right. referendum. Um, maybe I'll read a couple. Uh, Maxwell says, why did BHP support the yes vote? And John asks, why did you only contribute to the yes side and not to the no side of the, of the debate? Well, thanks, Maxwell and John. And, and these are really important questions. And, I, and I've glad, I'm glad that you've asked them. Look, I, I understand and respect that there were diverse views and perspectives on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament referendum. And it was a vote taken by the people of Australia and we respect the outcome. And I also appreciate that people had different perspectives on BHP support and that not everyone agreed with our view or with the fact that we took a position. So I'd like to explain our perspective. And, and look, I get asked often about my views on, on when should a corporate get involved in social issues. And my answer is business shouldn't get involved in contested social issues unless there's a very strong linkage to their business case. And there needs to be a thick line connecting the social issue to the business case. And I can't think of a social issue with greater connection to BHP's business than Indigenous advancement. And that's why we've been supportive of Indigenous constitution rec recognition since 2015. This isn't new for BHP and, and our relationships with traditional owners and other indigenous partners are some of the most important relationships we have as a business. I mean, we operate on the traditional lands of indigenous peoples at many of our locations around the world. We partner widely with indigenous communities and have long-term agreements with traditional owners and other First Nations peoples. And these are critical relationships to BHP's ability to start new projects expand existing projects, and to operational continuity. And they go to the heart of what we do as a mining company, and they're integral to our business success and to the creation of long-term shareholder value. Now, we engaged extensively over the past 18 months with many representatives from traditional owner groups to develop our reconciliation action plan. As a matter of fact, it was our sixth reconciliation action plan. And this engagement that we had confirmed that our indigenous partners expected BHP to advocate for a voice. And my own personal engagement with the First Nations Heritage Protection Alliance confirmed the same thing. The choice in this referendum was always with the Australian people. But for BHP, the reasons for supporting a voice were clear. And they were in the best interests of the company. The Australian people have spoken, and we respect that result. And for BHP, we'll now continue to progress the implementation of our Indigenous People Policy and our Reconciliation Action Plan, which we've developed in partnership with our traditional owners. And that's our path forward from here. Switching things um, up a bit, this is a question from Karen, and she asks about um, AI. She says, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence at the moment. Where does BHP stand on this? And do you think it's going to be useful for the mining industry? Well, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, you know, automating our operations uh, is something we're doing more and more of uh, to make them safer and to make them more efficient. Um, you know, if you look at Western Australian iron ore, for example, it is an enormously complex 
operations. Hundreds of kilometers between mine and port, railway, conveyor belts, dumpers. I mean, it's, there's a lot of moving parts through that end-to-end -end, um, supply chain. And it is virtually impossible for a human to optimize all the decisions uh, along that supply chain. And so we use AI as a decision support system. Uh, you know, a human ultimately makes the decision, but all the permutations and combinations are crunched in the background by an AI system. So AI is evolving in our industry, um, and we will continue to make good use of it. But, but Gab, to be clear, uh, we're not using things like chat GPT in the business. You know, that, that's, that's not within the scope of what we're looking at. We're really looking at these decision support systems uh, you know, to help our operators with, with complex uh, decision making. Understood. Um, Ken, I'm going to um, move to Samarco now, and this is a question from Barry. He actually asks, is there an update on progress at Samarco? And what is your view on when the litigation will be finalised? Right. So, great question. As you know, I always, I always give an update at every AGM for our shareholders around progress at, at Samarco, and I'll do the, I'll do the same thing uh, again this year. But for those of you who are not familiar, um, Samarco is a non-operated joint venture in Brazil. Um, it's 50% it's owned by Valet and 50% owned by BHP. We are both shareholders, but it's an independent company, and so our participation is through a, is through a board. Now, there was a, a tailings dam failure uh, back in 2015. It was a tragic incident where 19 people lost their lives. Um, and on the back of that, uh, there, there was a, a foundation created called Renova. Um, and it was established to redress, to redress the social, community, and environmental impacts of the failure. And so if I step through each of those in turn, um, in terms of em environmental remediation, that's largely complete. Uh, you know, the, 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 the turbidity of the water has returned to levels, you know, pre the dam failure. Uh, the riverbanks have been stabilized. Uh, the, the tailings are non-toxic, so they support revegetation, and so the revegetation has occurred. So the environmental remediation is largely complete. Um, there were a couple of, of communities that were impacted, and, and we, we've had to resettle those. And, and that's taken longer than we would have liked. If you can imagine, you know, resettling a community, you've, you've, got to, you've got to procure the land, and then you've got to do a town plan, and then everybody has to sign off on the town plan, and then individual homes have to be, have to be designed, and, and every family got to design a, a bespoke home. Um, you know, there's a lot of red tape around that. COVID happened. Um, but we're making good progress now. And, and so the community resettlement is about 85% complete. I was just there in June, and I think you know, the communities are beautiful, and I think they're gonna be uh, you know, a, a great, um, something that we can be proud of, I think, by when, they're, when they're complete. But we're 85% of the way there, families are moving in, schools are operating, community centers are up and running again. And then the third area is, is compensation, and, and about, over 400,000 people uh, have been compensated. Half of that number is, is people who lost access uh, to water for some days after the dam failure. A and the balance are people who had direct or indirect impacts in both the formal and in, in informal um, economy. And so there's been both a, a process for, for direct compensation of people who had documentation, and then there's a, a, a court-supervised process called the novel system for people who are in the informal economy who don't have documentation, and then we've been able to um, have a process, a court-supervised process, in order to compensate um, those people as well. So, so the final piece um, around resolving this is, 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 is about the outstanding matters involving both the state and federal government. Um, we're in negotiations on the final resolution of the ongoing claims in Brazil. Um, and you know it's in, impossible to determine, you know, when that's going to be complete. But we are in uh, active negotiations with both the federal and state uh, and state governments there. And then alongside that, there's a there's a UK class action being brought by a UK law firm, which is in our view unnecessary because it duplicates all the matters that are being covered by the work of the Renova Foundation and the legal proceedings that are already happening in Brazil, both through the courts and with the state and, and, and federal government. So we deny the claims and, and we're defending that, that action in the UK. Thanks for the update. 
um, Ken, I'm going to um, move to decarbonisation now. Um, and, and you did mention it in the intro, but Vanessa has a sp specific question and she says, how are you decarbonising our business, the BHP business, and what are the technology leaps that are needed um, to happen? And she mentions um, uh, OEMs um, and how fast they're moving to electrify. Right, so OEMs for everybody is original equipment manufacturer, so that's the people like Caterpillar, you know, who build our, who build our trucks. Look, it's a great question, uh, Vanessa, so thank you. Um, now, again, I think for everybody's benefit, we gave an operational decarbonization presentation back in June, and it's on our website. And if you haven't seen that, it's pretty interesting stuff, and, and it shows how we plan on decarbonizing uh, you know, our, mi our mine sites operationally, and it's, and, it's, and it's worth going to the website and having a look. But just to, to refresh everyone's memory, um, we had an 11% reduction in operational greenhouse gas emissions in, in 23 compared to, to 22, and that was largely off the back of renewable power purchase agreements uh, that we executed here in Australia. Um, and we've reduced our operational greenhouse gas emissions by 32% since financial year 2020, which is our baseline, which is our baseline year. So you might ask, um, if you've already achieved more than a 30% reduction, why, why is the 2030 target still at 30%? And the reality is this is an absolute uh, emissions reduction target, and we are going to grow the business between now and financial year 2030. Again, we talked earlier about you know, some of the questions around growth in the business, and there's Janssen coming on board, and, and we've got the growth opportunities that are embedded in the Oz Minerals transaction. There's other uh, you know, brownfield transact uh, um, uh, opportunities that we're looking at across the business. So we're going to grow the business going forward, and, and it's an absolute reduction. Uh, that we need to achieve. And so emissions are likely going to go up again and we're going to have to work hard to bring them back down again. And this is, comes to the whole OEM uh, component is, is, is we'll continue to execute uh, power purchase agreements with renewable energy to reduce our, our footprint, uh, particularly on scope two. But on scope one, it's all about um, you know, the diesel emissions that come from our earth moving equipment. And to do that, we're going to have to electrify our uh, earth moving equipment. We're working hard with the OEMs um, in order to develop solutions around that. We've actually placed the purchase order for our first electric truck. Um, and so, you know, as a pilot, as a pilot project, which, which, is, which is quite exciting. But we're aiming to electrify, electrify our fleet of around 650 heavy haul trucks, rep replacing their fossil fuel engines with electric motors and batteries uh, between uh, you know, now and, 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 the and the following decade. So we're not there yet, but trials of the electric trucks are expected to start in uh, our Wayo iron ore operations uh, next year. Thanks, Ken. Uh, the final question from Fiona, she says, what's keeping you up at night in respect to BHP and its future? Look, as I said in my opening, we've made a number of strategic changes over the last three years, and I think the company is in a really good place. But, you know, I guess finishing where we started, if there is one thing um, that, you know, is of, a, of an ongoing concern and that gives us sort of chronic unease, it's, it's safety. Um, it's concern for the welfare and safety of our employees and, and our contractors. And we have to keep working really hard to make sure we're identifying and doing our best to eliminate the risks um, in our business. We have more than 80,000 employees and contractors working for us every day. Our highest priority is to protect their safety and well-being. Um, so that's, that's job one. And I guess if there's you know, an area of constant concern, it's that. Um, but in terms of the balance of the business, when I think about the portfolio, I think we're well positioned. Um, if I look at the balance sheet, I think we're, I think we're in a good place from the balance sheet. I think we're, it's strong. Um, and I think we're working really hard on our social value agenda across those six pillars that, that, we've, that we've talked about to make sure that we're focused not just on creating value in the short term, but in the long term um, for our shareholders. And I think you know, the social value pillars are an important component of creating sustainable long-term shareholder value. Um, but overall, I think our agenda is in pretty good shape. That's great. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And that's actually all we've got time for today. So really appreciate the time you've taken and really appreciate um, the update that you've given us about where BHP's at. Terrific. My pleasure. Thanks, Gab. And just a reminder, the annual general meeting is happening in Adelaide on the 1st of November. And if you can't attend in person, you can watch it live stream from our website. Thank you everyone for joining today's session and I hope you enjoyed it.